Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Community Platform. We are all aware that we're in the month of Muharram. In fact, I think most likely that it will be Ashura on Sunday, I suppose depending on where one is. We repeat the story of Karbala every year. Do we really learn anything from that story? How do we contextualize it? It seems that we have become people of history who learn the lesson of history for either passing an exam or an incident that happened. Anything that happens in Islam happens to teach us. What does Karbala teach us? It's not that long ago that we were talking about what was happening in Gaza. Never thought it would happen again. Today we are witnessing another massacre. We keep repeating the same old scenario, deja vu. And I often wonder that in, within our faith, there are so many incidents that teach us, and Karbala is a very important incident. Today we're asking our audiences, what have we learned from Karbala? How do we apply that to our today's lives, collectively and individually? Please call, the number is on the screen, and tell us, did Karbala change? How does Karbala change your lifestyle? For me, as an individual, it has taught me I will never bow to a tyrant. That's the lesson that I look at it. How do we collectively deliver on that? If we were collectively delivering on that, could Gaza be burning again? I'm not sure. I am delighted to have two of my colleagues. Asalaamu Alaikum Majid. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Majid, first I would like to say to you, Hajj Mubarak. Khair Mubarak. No, it must, what a wonderful experience. It's been brilliant, very enlightening. Yes, it's good to have you here. I think you've lost weight. I just lost the hair, that's it. <laughs> but it's good to have you. And of course, um, <coughs> friend, Qasim, how are you? Alhamdulillah. You were not well last week. No, I wasn't. I know you weren't. It's got a bit of a sore throat, but no, I'm okay. No, but I'm sure you will do well. Are you, otherwise, you're okay. Alhamdulillah. Right. Yeah. Let me start with you, Majid. You've just come back very recently from Hajj. What a delightful experience. Uh, renewing that uh, vigor and that uh, emotion. Does that change? Does visiting a place like that change one person? And if so, how long for? You know, I mean, we, we're, we're into Muharram and we keep going back to what happened at Karbala. And we think, you know, we've learned something. What did Hajj do for you that you could maybe talk, tell us that, did it change your lifestyle? Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hajj in itself is a journey of a lifetime. Um, when I went there, these are like my own personal thoughts on this issue. Um, a, <clears throat> a lot of the... The events that we read about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the the beginning of Islam, mm. the struggle for Islam, the the conflict between the haq and the batil, mm. the struggling Meccan period in which the Sahaba were tortured, but they still stuck onto this message. Mm -hmm. Message. They still conveyed this deen of Islam. Mm -hmm. They still fought for this deen of Islam, and they continued on. All of those <coughs> manazir, you can say, mm -hmm. the word manzir, yeah. Mm -hmm. All of those begin to unfold one mm -hmm. by one. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the Kaaba, mm -hmm. it reminds you that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his mm -hmm. Mubarak feet were the ones which used to make the wafadir sure. on this Kaaba. Sure. Sure. It was around this Kaaba that mm -hmm. the very first ever demonstration took place uh, in the early days of Islam mm -hmm. when the Muslims they formed a line. Mm -hmm. And Umar ibn al-Khattab prior to this march, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are we not on the haqq? Yeah. Are we not on the truth? The Prophet says, yes we are. So why are we hiding? To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm -hmm. he revealed the verse and proclaim openly now mm -hmm. the deen of yes. Islam. Go public now. So the Muslims, they formed the first line and they showed the Quraysh in a very uh, clear way what is the message of Islam. The black, the white, oh. the rich, the poor, the, um, the, uh, the one who is free, the one who is not free, mm -hmm. man and a woman, mm -hmm. the young and the old, mm -hmm. all of them, these are the people who are part of this new deen of Islam. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me of all the struggles of uh, the Prophet ﷺ, the struggles of the Sahaba, mm -hmm. of what they had to do for this deen. These were the places people were tortured. Mm -hmm. This of is the course. place where the, the hierarchy of the Quraysh used mm -hmm. to systematically torture Muslims, men and women. Mm -hmm. They used to abuse the slaves. Mm -hmm. the, they used to beat the Muslims mm -hmm. in broad daylight. 
etc. So all of these uh, um, mm -hmm. things that we have read about, they give life to these, well, to yes, these shoes. Yes, no, no, that, that, that's... Um, we, how, do we, how do we bring that, um, Qasim, how do we bring it? What Majid is saying is that this was our history. We have examples that we cannot buy down to tyrants. Mm -hmm. And men, women and children all well together. How can that happen now? Are we, are we listening to the wrong people? Are we uh, creating relationship with people who cannot help us? Mm. What's going on? Well, the, if you look at it today, uh, if you, if you try and contextualize what he said today, that does seem to be the case in the sense that when, when, when you see, like for example, what's happening in Gaza, mm -hmm. you're seeing an unrelenting bombardment, indiscriminate killing of men, women and children. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you're seeing the impotency of the Arab leaders. Do Just the Arab leaders? What about the Ummah? Yes, yeah, mm. yes. Well, well, well in, mm. in terms of the rulers, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the people who have the ability mm. to send, you know, military to go and liberate those lands mm -hmm. who are doing nothing. And then, yes, there is mm. also a sense of culpability that does lie on the people themselves in that they should be accounting their rulers. They should be speaking the truth to the rulers and telling them, look, they mm. are just as valuable, yeah? mm. they, are, they, are, they are just as much as part of the Ummah mm. as we are mm -hmm. under your, uh, your so-called uh, leadership. <coughs> Why should they be any different? Mm. And instead what happens mm. is that those of us that are concerned, th those of us uh, that, that do care and want to see an actual change, mm. we go to the same institutions exhaustively, habitually, time Such and time again. For example, the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, they think that the United Nations would give them the platform mm -hmm. to not only air those grievances, but mm -hmm. those grievances would become politicized and put into action. Mm -hmm. But this is nonsense. If you look at the history of it in relation to Palestine, every single UN resolution that's been passed where Israel has been shown and has been held culpable well, not been held culpable, has been accused mm -hmm. and has, there's been evidence documented to show that they've been guilty of war crimes, mm -hmm. of human rights abuses, you mm -hmm. know, of, you know, pillaging mm -hmm. the people of their land, stripping them of their dignity. You know, th these things are real and they're happening and yet the United States has vetoed every single one. Mm -hmm. When you look at the United Nations, the people who actually hold the power, who are they? The people in, in the UN Security Council. It's the superpowers. So really, mm -hmm. it's a false sense of... Um, uh, it, 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 makes the pe it makes people think that they, are, they have a platform where mm. they can actually make a change, but they can't. So that's mm. the, uh, the, uh, the uh, UN. Mm. And then, you know, we can go deeper into that. We can look at, for example, Israel itself. I mean, if we look at Israel, there seems to be this, this uh, consensus that they, they want to negotiate or they want to talk. But if you look at the reality of the ground, let's take what happened in Gaza about mm. three, four years ago. The Israelis that were coming out, you know, not only in Israel, but were protesting, were describing the Palestinian people to cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at their marches and rallies, mm -hmm. they, they have no concern for them. So, so then the question becomes, mm -hmm. are words enough for these kind of people? I, I think you because, raise, yeah. because constantly what happens is when mm -hmm. this happens, you get demonstrations, you get marches, mm -hmm. you get people who have a zeal within them, mm -hmm. which is good. But are we... Are we simply exhausting the same old rhetoric, the mm. same old, you know, uh, 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 so-called solutions? Mm. Or is it the case that we need to be thinking outside the box and looking elsewhere or doing something different? Well, I think you've raised two or three points. Uh, Majid, I want you to um, just to elaborate. Majid is saying that we are actually maybe using the wrong platform. Maybe United Nations is not the right platform and demonstrating outside whether it's the Israeli embassy or whether it's the American embassy, well, why would they listen? So, do you believe that our platform is wrong? Do we need a different platform? And if so, what can be that platform? And if we have to march, why are we not outside the Muslim embassies? Saudi Arabia, for instance, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia. You know, these are the perceived leaders in the Islamic world. Shouldn't we be saying to them, excuse me, I'm holding you accountable. Why are you not assisting? Why are you allowing Gaza to be destroyed? Yes, I agree with you. Yes, so going back to the United Nations. Remember, before the United Nations, there was a League of Nations. And the reason the League of Nations finished is because all the superpowers who were involved inside that kind of left it. It became a defunct organization. And the United Nations is no different. Um, the, as uh, the brother has mentioned, Qasim, yeah? mm -hmm. Qasim mentioned uh, mm -hmm. that there's a major 
mm. players in the world, mm. they're the ones who run the show here. Mm. If the United Nations has such credibility, mm. then how come the, in 2003, Britain and the US bypassed the UN resolution not to invade Iraq? Yes. And yeah. they still did it. Absolutely. I, so interesting for, for, any, for anybody, yeah. for anybody yeah. to say, let's go back to the United Nations mm -hmm. and, and give it that legitimacy, mm -hmm. give, uh, say this is the only platform that we can use to really air our voices and start quoting resolution, this resolution, that. I mean, Israel's broken every single one of them. And the United Nations, if you go back, I mean, I've got a caller on, let's take the caller. But the fact is that uh, if you remember what happened in Bosnia, United Nations and the safe enclave. That's right, yeah. They failed. They failed miserably. to intervene at all. Let's take this caller. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Thank you. Um, you have a question, a statement. Today we're discussing uh, what has Karbala taught us? What did we learn, if we learned anything? Yes. Um, firstly, sister uh, Anjum, um, condolences to all of you on the martyrdom of uh, Imam Hussein. Uh, I've got three points, I think, three lessons that I feel we can learn, and they're all connected. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Firstly, um, this event is so significant for the whole Ummah, all of us. So the first thing is we need to get over any divisions or factionalism mm -hmm. about whom Imam Hussein laid his life down for. He laid his life down for the, the entire Ummah and the entire deen. Um, and the reason why he did that, I think the lesson we can learn is that the sanctity of our beliefs are absolutely fundamental. So life, first and foremost, should be about faith and ensuring that that faith can survive uh, for present times and for future times. That's absolutely essential. The second point I'd like to make, which I think is linked with that, is that is about authority. Who does authority in the Muslim Ummah lie with? Because we are surrounded, and we've had centuries of this, we're surrounded by despotic rule. And despotic rule is such a tyranny because it not only uh, oppresses the people, but actually it's, it's a curse, it's an oppression of the despot himself because he's put on a platform where he shouldn't be. He's not ruling under God's authority. He's not ruling justly and fairly. And if we allow this despotism to continue, we've allowed Islam to be distorted beyond all belief. Hmm. And we've seen, thank goodness, the Arab Spring where despots are being overturned, you know, with Gaddafi, with Saddam Hussein. The, the whole situation in Gaza is part of that struggle to be rid of oppression. And I come on to my third point, because this, I think, is linked with point two. And that is that we have such an obligation as Muslims in the West to not be quiet or passive. It is absolutely criminal for us to be silent, because silence is complicity. So we cannot sit back comfortably, because we are very comfortable and very safe in our homes and say that how terrible what's happening in Gaza. We need to actually do something about it. If the minimum we can do is raise our voice, then we have carried the message of Hussein, and we have made sure that that martyrdom was not in vain, because we all carry that responsibility in our daily lives. So we need to stop looking at events as history and see them actually unfold right before us and, and act that out in our daily lives, fighting oppression, standing up for justice, regardless, actually, of faith, of colour, of creed. You know, Martin Luther King did this. Every faith has this idea uh, of, of fighting oppression. Malcolm X did that. We need to be the, the, uh, the Malcolm X's, the Martin Luther King's of our time. We need to carry the message of Hussein in, in our daily lives. Sister, as always, you get to the point and you get to the heart of the matter. I'm eternally grateful <coughs> to you. Jazakallah khair for your time. Jazakallah. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. The first point that the sister uh, from Preston said is a the event was significant for all. And I like that, that collectiveness. Is that what we've lost, Qasim, the collectiveness? Well, well I, th I think one thing is important to point out is that every time there is a tragedy, mm -hmm. well, every day is a tragedy. In well, at the moment. <laughs> every day is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. But when there's something where that transgression mm -hmm. becomes prodigious to what we're seeing now, mm -hmm. full-scale invasion and whatnot, you do, the zeal is ignited within people, all kinds of people, not just Muslims as well, but also non-Muslims. So I think what the sister is saying is absolutely right, and we can see remnants of that, mm -hmm. but it's not enough. It's not enough that just having people coming out in, in, in a collective form, because the thing is, if you're going to be collective as well, it, Everyone universally agrees that what's taking place, murder, in any forms is wrong. But then the question becomes is, how are you then going to politicize this dissent in order to make a change? 
Now the problem here becomes is you've got people giving their own perspective mm -hmm. based on their viewpoint, based on their you know, way of life, etc. That, oh no, we should be going to the UN. No, we should be going to our MPs. No, we should be going to this, to that, etc. So what we need to make clear and be distinct is that when we want to strive for a solution, it must come from what she said. Is it must come from the deen, it must come from Islam. Mm -hmm. That should be the fundamental, the, 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 the focal point which we turn to. Now the, now the uprisings clearly show that. Mm -hmm. The uprisings that have taken place, Arab uprisings. exactly in Egypt, mm -hmm. Tunisia, mm -hmm. etc. That's precisely what they did. And that's what separates them, makes them distinct mm -hmm. to all the other, you know, for example, the uh, Iranian revolution, etc. But this is something, it's not just a descent towards the ruler, but rather they want to have their dignity, they want to have a foundation, a shield behind whom the Ummah can fight. And that shield that they're calling for is an Amir, is a leader which we don't have. So it is only, and this is what I am saying, is that the only way we can seek a just resolution towards this, a viable resolution, is that we do come to our senses and strive for this deen to become established and to elect an Amir hmm. who can then send in the armies to liberate Gaza because I can't see any other way. For six decades yeah. now, for six decades we've been negotiating, going to the table. Muslims themselves have become appeased into these organizations, thinking that they have power, that they can make a change, but they haven't. It's not amounted to anything, and that's the sad reality. I'm hearing what you're saying. I'll tell you where I'm having difficulty, uh, Majid. Yeah. <coughs> Where's the, you know, I keep coming back to this question. In fact, I am tired of listening to my own voice on this. <coughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> Where are we going to get this Amir? Where is this leadership going to come from? Where? Yeah, it'll come from within the Muslims. And let me just get you a quote on this issue. And it's somebody on Facebook posted this yesterday. Jazakallah to the brother. So all credit due to him. This is how the non-Muslims who are looking at the world realize that if certain things were to take place, like the brother mentioned, like the Muslims were to um, unite, even if it's a set of, a, a, a set of countries in a certain area, mm -hmm. there could be some problems. This is Henry Campbell Bannerman, mm -hmm. Prime Minister of the UK, in 1907. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this is 41 years before Israel was created. Look at his comment. Mm -hmm. It says, there are people who control spacious territories, teeming with manifest and hidden resources. They dominate the intersections of world routes. Their lands were the cradles of human civilization and religions. These people have one faith, one language, one history and the same aspirations. No natural barriers can isolate these people from one another. If perchance this nation were to be unified into one state, it would then take the fate of the world into its hands and would separate Europe from the rest of the world. Taking these considerations seriously, a foreign body shall be planted in the heart of this nation to prevent the convergence of its wings in such a way that it could exhaust its powers in never-ending wars. It could also serve as a springboard for the West to gain its co-fated objects. So here's... So here's the mm. Western world planning ahead in 1907. Yes, we had a Khilafah state there, mm. but it was very weak and a lot of the territories had become occupied by then. Mm -hmm. So in that capacity, he's saying, look, we cannot afford to have a Khilafah state mm -hmm. once again as a powerful, powerful state, as a powerful power that can challenge our interests in the Middle East. So that's um, why they created Saudi Arabia. This is why they give a country exactly. to the Saud, yes. the first yes. country in the, yes. in the world to be named after a family. Mm. How many other countries do we know mm. that are named Absolutely. after families? So these were given Jordanian, the mm. Jordanian king, mm. uh, the Sharifs, they were given this, uh, the power by the British. And 1947, this was a deliberate strategy to implant a state and give any excuse. The excuse was religion, but in fact it was Zionism which was, which was mm. uh, really the agenda which was being pushed here. Ever since then, we can see, uh, see the consequences that uh, the Muslims in this region have suffered, whether it's the, the whole area of Palestine or the surrounding territories mm -hmm. under the brutal regimes of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Jordan, Syria, like we're seeing right this moment in time, mm -hmm. where there's been dynasties of rules, mm -hmm. rule, and the British and the Americans have had no objections until these people struck their interests, and therefore these people are now not flavor of the month. They need to be removed, and they need to start negotiating now with newer people newer groups of people, newer factions who can become the ruling elite in these countries. So what I'm hearing from both of you, that learning from Karbala, and it keeps coming back because you and I and all three of us have had this conversation before. Um, let's take this caller um, and then... Uh, brother Yaqub from Blackburn. Salam alaikum, brother. What is your Salam comment or your question? Salam alaikum, brothers, as well, those who are sitting over there. 
Right. First of all, what, what I'm saying is Muslim leader, they has only served the Western interest. And if, if we stand up against them, or if we make such a kind of organization, the Western and our own Muslim ruler will give title as extremist. That's the problem we have. And the whole world convinced against that group, like such an example I give you, I'm not following that particular group, Hezbollah Tahir, or political Taliban, or such a such a Muslim extremist group, they will call it terrorist. So they don't want to see our organizations. If you stand up anything for the Muslim interest, you are labeled a terrorist. There are so many other societies, like a Siu Sena, or VHP, or RSS, or BJP, or Evangelico, or APAC, or IRS, or EDL, BNP, they are not calling a terrorist. But if you Muslims stand up such a body, make organize, you will call it terrorist. And the biggest shock thing is our ulma is divided in this thing as well. They have a two opinion. One ulma will follow another body. Another ulma will follow another body. Half of ulma will call a terrorist as well. And half of ulma will justify this organization. This is the problem we have. We won't be get united. We need to sell out Dean, right? That's what is it. The, we have to fight somewhere. Where are the Muslims? I can't see the Muslim. Give me the Muslim. Show me, show me the Muslim. There is no Muslim in the world. There are Devbandi, there are Barelvi, there are Shia, there are what kind of, uh, Hezbollah Tahir or Jamaat Islami. I can't find the Muslim. Show me the Muslim, I will organize and I will lead this community. I can't Still, find the Muslim. They are all divided. Just hold on, Brother Yaqub, my colleague would like to respond. Yeah, just to add to the point, you mentioned Salahuddin al Ayyubi. In fact, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, when we study his life, at his time is when Masjid al Aqsa was occupied. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic, yeah. uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. kind of timely discussion that during his era, mm -hmm. Masjid al Aqsa was actually mm -hmm. occupied. There was many divisions. Mm -hmm. The ulama, they were just discussing their own issues at that time as well. The armies, they were not really worried. There was no organized army in terms of gearing themselves towards planning an activity to liberate Masjid the laqsa mm. So the first thing, or the first few steps that Sal uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi, what he did, he began discussions. <clears throat> so people say, you know, just talking doesn't achieve anything. Oh. You know, it has to be something else. Of course it does. Okay. He started to discuss with the ulama. Mm. He began to talk about the, the, the fact that the Masjid al laqsa which is the third holiest site, mm. is being, has been occupied by crusader forces, mm. and they're using it for stables for animals. This is a, you know, an, an, an area where the Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he mentions that not even one angel uh, has, sorry, there is not even one hand span of space where an angel hasn't stepped foot on this, in this particular area. So this is the azmat of this particular place. So Salahuddin al Ayyubi, his first thing was raising discussions and even organizing those armies who had divisions amongst themselves, who were in fighting, whether it was clan fighting, whether it was tribal fighting, to go and discuss with them and unify them with a unique vision of Islam. Mm -hmm. To bring back the ideas of what Quran says, what the Sunnah says on unification, on the fact that the Ummah is one, their, their, their road is one, their vehicle is one, their movement should be one as well. Uniting them, getting them rid away from their nationalistic or their regionalistic uh, uh, kind of baggage Absolutely. that they had. No. After he did this, mm -hmm. he began to move ahead forward there and managed to then organize the army such that they went and they... they uh, leadership. Yeah, they can yeah. Jazakallah yes. khair. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, okay. You've, you, you've raised an important point. We're very grateful. Thank you. But again, it keeps coming back. I mean, Yaqub Bhai mentioned it. Qasim has talked about it. Uh, you've talked about it. But we're going to come back. And re I think that the, 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 the weakness is that we don't have um, Salauddin's. You know, where are we going to find them? Let's, we're going to take a very short break. Please join me back within the next few minutes and call us to get involved. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Sharia Nummer are proud to announce the launch of the new long-awaited Sharia Nummer website, your number one Islamic matrimonial agency. 
The new Shadi and Ummah is packed with lots of new features such as live chat. Chat and interact with other members in private and public rooms. Create and manage your own public and private galleries, all done in your own account. Share your favourite video clips and music in your very own music and video galleries. Shadi and Ummah have also added your very own mailbox. Send private messages to people you like. Register today and create your free profile. Only at shadionumma.com. Here at Joseph Fraser Solicitors, we have a dedicated team that will assist you in a wide range of legal services. We can offer our clients help with personal injury, accidents at work, industrial deafness, Islamic wills and family law. If you want a law firm that can provide you with a difference, then contact Joseph Fraser Solicitors today on 08456-537-529. Al Baham Grammar School, an independent school for 11 to 16 year old girls. Do you have a daughter? Do you want the best education for her future? Then why not enroll today? We have excellent GCSE results and a good Ofsted report. At Al Baham Grammar School, we teach the national curriculum along with Arabic, Urdu, Quran, and Islamic studies. We have a spacious ICT suite and a new science laboratory. Al Baham Grammar School, a school with high expectations. Limited places available for 11 to 13 year old girls. For a brighter future for your daughter, please telephone 44. Or email info at albahan.org.uk. Al Faisal Travel Manchester. Hamari special offer. Umre ki shandar kamyabi ke baad ab Al Faisal ka intihai sasta aur munasib package. Sirf 2650 pound mein visa, ticket, accommodation, ziarat, mina service aur qurbani samet tamam suhuliyat. Limited package. Pehle aaye, pehle paaye. Digger packages bhi dastiyab. Al Faisal Travel Manchester. 224 Slade Lane, Long Sight, Manchester. Phone 0161 257 3325. Growing a marketing network online isn't easy. There are countless media outlets you can utilize in this multi-billion dollar industry. This raises a couple important questions. How can you be sure your voice is actually getting heard? And how can you be sure you're earning the most revenue possible as an entrepreneur? At Banner's Broker, we've created a program that not only helps you develop a productive, efficient, and dependable online advertising publishing campaign. We also give you the tools to help you meet your financial and lifestyle goals. Sign up today and truly discover a revolutionary way to earn revenue online. I am Zahrana, 45 years old, and thank you for your heart. Today, the people are very لیکن خیال رہے کہ ان مصروفیات میں آپ کی صحت متاثر نہ ہو اگر صحت کی ناسازی میں مشورہ درکار ہو تو عالمی شہرت یافتہ مولیج پانچ سو سے زائد لائف ٹی وی پروگرامز میں شمولیت کا عزاز آلہ درجہ کی معلومات اور بیلوس مشروعوں سے دنیا بھر کے لوگ مستفید براد فیٹ برنگم یا لندن میں ملاقات کے لیے آج ہی رابطہ قائم کریں دار شفا تجدید کی روایت میں آر کی سمانت یورو پاک کارگو سروسز لیمیٹڈ یو کے میں کامیابی کے بعد اب فرانس اور جرمنی سے اپنی خدمات کا آغاز کر چکا ہے اگر آپ پاکستان یا آزاد کشمیر کے کسی بھی شہر میں اپنے پیاروں کو توفہ یا پاسل بھیجنا چاہتے ہیں تو اب ہی کال کریں 0207-458-4422 بغیر کسٹمز ڈیوٹی کے سو فیصد گارنٹی کے ساتھ وہ بھی صرف ایک پاؤنڈ پچاس پینس سے دھماکہ خیز آفر بیس کیلو سامان پر پانچ پاؤنڈ کا فری وارچر حاصل کریں یورو پاک کارگو سروسز لیمیٹڈ Did you know you can get free cavity wall insulation and loft insulation with Go Brit Green? In a non-insulated home, 25% of the heat you produce disappears straight through the roof and another 35% through the walls, wasting you hundreds of pounds each year. Insulating your walls and loft will save you up to 400 pounds on your energy bills. To register for free loft and cavity wall insulation, call us now on 01254-278-354. Or visit us online at www.gobritgreen.co.uk. 
ਲੋ ਜੀ ਦੇਸੀ ਰੋਟੀ ਟੁਕਰ ਖਾਣ ਲਈ ਹੁਣ ਇੱਕੋ ਹੀ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਲੋਰੀ ਕੜਾਈ ਤੇ ਚਰਗਾ ਹੁਣ ਵਿਮਸਲੋ ਰੋਡ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਦੇਸੀ ਖਾਣਿਆਂ ਲਈ ਹੋਰ ਕਿਤੇ ਜਾਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੋਰ ਕੜਾਈ ਤੇ ਚਰਗੇ ਤੇ ਤੇ ਸ਼ਰੀਫ ਲਿਆਓ ਕੜਾਈ ਕੋ ਸ਼ਨਿਓਟੀ ਕੁਨਾ ਕੋ ਚਿਕਨ ਕੜਾਈ ਰੀਸਾ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਦੇਸੀ ਖਾਣੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਖਾ ਕੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਲੋਰ ਦੀ ਯਾਦ ਆ ਜਾਏ ਬਿਹਤਰੀਨ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਮਾਲ ਲੋਰੀ ਕੜਾਈ ਤੇ ਚਰਗਾ 9 ਟੂ 15 ਵਿਮਸਲੋ ਰੋਡ ਮਾਨਚੈਸਟਰ ਫੋਨ 0161225785 Starting 27th November, Airblue proudly announces four weekly direct flights from Manchester to Islamabad and Lahore on our newly inducted Airbus A340. You can now enjoy excess baggage saving, more frequencies, wide comfortable cabin and convenient timings. Airblue, fly redefined. Maida Restaurant Blackburn, North West mein khano ki sabse zyada variety. फैमिली माहौल में खानों की 80 से ज्यादा अक्सर किड्स अंडर 10 ईट फ्री लजीज और मुनफरिद खाने स्पेशल बुफे फ्राइडे सैटरडे एंड संडे शाम 5:00 से 11:00 तक मेन्यू ऑर्डर पर 15% डिस्काउंट Maida Banqueting Hall Blackburn jadid sahuliyat ke sath 400 afraad ke baithne ki gunjaish birthdays parties aur weddings outdoor catering ki sahulat bhi Maida Restaurant and Banqueting Hall Blackburn 16 Anum Blackburn phone 01254 676797 मिठाइयों के कदरदानों और शौकीनों के लिए खुशखबरी मुश्ताक स्वीट्स की बफलो मिल्क से तैयार की गई खालिस देसी घी की लजीज मिठाइयों की तीन आउटलेट्स जिनमें क्वालिफाइड शेफ्स ताजा मिठाइयों की बेशुमार वैरायटी तैयार करते हैं हमारी स्पेशलिटी बफलो मिल्क बर्फी हो खास क्रीमी रसमलाई या फिर ताजा देसी मक्खन आप कुछ भी ले जाइए जरूर पसंद करेंगे 102 एलम रॉक रोड सॉल्ट ले 143 लोजेल्स रोड हैंड्सवर्थ और 554 कवेंट्री रोड स्मॉल हीथ मुश्ताक स्वीट्स नाम ही काफी है ऐसे कारपेट सन फ्लोरिंग बर्मिंगहम पर जबरदस्त सेल का इलाज हर तरह के कारपेट लेमिनेट फ्लोरिंग वाइनल तो रग्स अब नाकाबले यकीन कीमतों पर हमारे 15000 स्क्वायर फीट पर मुश्तमिल बोर्डसली ग्रीन के शानदार वेयरहाउस पर तशरीफ लाइए या स्पार्क ब्रू बर्मिंगहम में 15000 स्क्वायर फीट पर मुश्तमिल शोरूम पर विजिट कीजिए ऐसे कारपेट सन फ्लोरिंग ओपन 7 डेज Karbala, what did we learn? What lessons? How do we use the story that brings tears even now to the to our eyes? How do how, how do we live that today? What lessons did we learn or not learn? Seems like that every year we speak about Karbala, rarely talk about how it should have affected us, how it should have changed our lives. Has it changed our lives? Call me. The number is on the screen. Majid, we we were discussing um, how Salahuddin. We were discussing, you know, and how he uh, stressed the importance of conversation. You have to have conversation with someone to change the hearts, and then you bring people together. And then he was tough. Anyone who tried to be divisive, he was he was tough with them. And we came back that it was a strong leadership. And we've had this conversation so many times. We have, yeah. You know that even I am getting a bit tired of it. Um, where are we seeking our leader? Who is going to be that either the Saladin? Who's going to be, you know, who's going to lead us and take us out, take us out of this? Because basically, the Ummah is in a mess. Definitely, yeah. Not only do we need a leader, we need the system which backs up this leader as well. Mm. Such so that if that one leader f- is perished, then there's a generation of leaders ready for them to be to move ahead. and march ahead with the same cause for Islam. We find in the early days of Islam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he left this world, he left a generation of statesmen, a generation of leaders. Any one of them could have assumed the position of leadership and the Muslim ummah would have set on on, his, on the course that is on. 
at powerful leaders like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar al-Farooq, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, all these people, and even after this as well, when we look at even the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the leadership even after this, we had the, the Ottomans as an example, which is just down the road from us, which is Turkey, mm. not far off. Turkey was ruling the Muslim world. This was the seat of the Khilafah state. And the Europeans were terrified from them mm. because they were on a, on a mission when it came to the spread of Islam. And they were unstoppable. Mm. And they reached to the gates of Vienna. Mm. They mm. conquered parts of France. Mm. And when they got to the France and to the gates of Vienna, this is when even here in this country, in, in England, mm. the, the, mm. began to get politically nervous as in what could be the fate mm. next? Mm. What's going to stop these people? So the leadership uh, mm. is, is born out of the ideology of Islam. So it's a system. It's a system. We're it's looking for a system, aren't we then? We are, that's right, because yeah. Because th th that tells me that first you have to have a framework. That's right. I think within the Quran and the Hadith we have that, that framework. It's a system that we need, wow. isn't it? What is the system that we need to implement to create that leadership? Okay, so even when we talk about the system, mm -hmm. first and foremost everything starts with ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So that would start with discussing, discussing these, conveying these ideas with people, enlightening them as to this system uh, in question, okay. which is that we want to implement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, like uh, the brother mentioned mm -hmm. uh, in the break, for example, people who say where well, conversation is, is, is a futile. So, for example, Karl Marx, mm -hmm. he wanted to implement communism. And where was he inspired? He was inspired here. He wrote it like in Manchester. Khomeini, for example, the Iranian Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did that from France. He did that from outside. Mm -hmm. And yet it happened. Look at many of the leaders, for example, like Gaddafi, mm -hmm. Assad, etc., mm -hmm. educated here. Mm -hmm. And then they go there. The economic policies, etc. Mm -hmm. So just to say that the conversation itself is not enough, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, the uh, conversation itself is futile, mm -hmm is wrong, uh, number one, and secondly, to say that, you know, well, that's happening there, what can we do from here? Well, that's wrong as well, because these people were outside of uh, their countries, mm -hmm. and yet they inspired all these changes and all these revolutions. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, Karl Marx, for example, he implemented the system of communism, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, the system that we're talking about is the system of Islam. Yeah, so we're talking essentially about a state whereby the basis, the, the fundamental, the foundations, mm -hmm. yeah, the laws come from the source, which is the Sharia. That's what we're saying. So, and, and that is something that's in harmony mm -hmm. with human beings, with our fitra, because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. So naturally it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows best what man is capable of, what he's not capable of. Yeah, this is why we have the khudud, we have the, mm -hmm. we have the system which would ensure stability and law and order within society. But also in terms of our foreign policy, yeah, the, the, the foreign policy which we'd have is precisely this, whereby when we have injustices that are taking place in different countries, for example, Gaza, mm -hmm. yeah, or injustices taking place in Pakistan mm -hmm. or Libya, whichever country it is, yeah, then the, the, the uh, Khilafah, the Amir, can then send out the delegations, the armies to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not n not like what the Arab League has done now, where they where they're sending ministers, you know, towards Gaza. What's you know, what's that going to do? They're going to go there, mm -hmm. hold a few babies, and this. this. No nonsense. Th it, it's only under the uh, the leader who would rule over the system of Islam, where you where you're going to get the actual change, that change, that tangible change, which is what 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 we've been talking about, what everyone wants to see. Just to pick up from this, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Whilst we were, I was at Hajj, mm. uh, having lots of discussions with different people about these issues, you can find that there's a very clear path the Muslims they want to take, but they don't know how to get there. Mm. So if, somebody say, if we say to people, what's the solution for Palestine, this is going to be liberation mm. by force. Mm. It's not going to be by sitting down here and having this peace treaty uh, in, in the White House and coming to Downing Street mm. and then going to France. It doesn't happen that way. And that's the last six decades are evidence of this. Mm. People are quite clear in terms of how what are the things that need to be done in order for mm. these issues to be resolved mm. but not to show how to get there so some of the things that we were looking at Saudi Arabia mm. this is the place where Makkah and Medina is people mm. say this is the house of Islam mm. how would a future Khilafah state mm. if it was here what would it do mm. so there's three million people there in congregation mm. how do you mobilize three million people exactly. so where are the banners I see the Zamzam Tower yeah. I see yeah. a lot of the next I see H&M I see all these banners there. Where, are the, where is the mobilization? Where is the media? Mm. Where is the billboard talking about key Islamic messages? What's happening around the world? And as one brother he mentioned to me, 
Hajj is the international conference of the Muslim Ummah. Indeed. And to strike terror in the, in the hearts of those people who want to inflict injury or to uh, bring harm to this Muslim Ummah. Mm. This is what he said, an international conference of the Muslim Ummah. Mm. In the books that I was studying prior to going to Hajj, mm. it talked about how the ulama in the past, mm. they used to obviously prepare for the Hajj and perform all the rituals. Mm. But whilst they were there, they would discuss fiqh. They would discuss Islamic jurisprudence. Why? Because scholars from all parts of the world are coming down mm. and they would then sit down and get perspectives on this, which shows there was all this dialogue. Mm. Mm. Not the way the Saudi regime makes Hajj now that don't talk about politics, don't do this, haram, bidda, shirk and everything like this. Go shopping. Go shopping instead. Yeah. yeah? Have Starbucks. A, a, have a McDonald's burger, have a coffee at Starbucks mm. instead. Mm. So you can find that a future Khilafah state would use opportunity. Hajj is not something once in every 20 years, it's every single year. And it's a place where people congregate throughout the year for Umrah and for other Islamic activities. Um, so these are things which the brother was talking about and it was quite opening. So when we were, were talking about what's Mursi doing? We yeah. sit next to the different. What is Morsi doing? Oh, brother, he's a bit stuck. Why is he stuck for? He won elections. Mm. He had a manifesto. Muslim Brotherhood, since the 1920s, have been saying they want Islam, they want Sharia. What's happened today? They, their, their members have died and have taught, been tortured in prison. What for Morsi to come into power mm. and still to do the same thing which Mubarak did? Mm. So, what's the difference between a democrat and a dictator? Mm. No answer. Mm. Why isn't the Rafa border being opened up? No answer. So, the thing is there. The people can see that a lot of the things have been championed forward, have been vague. Mm -hmm. What people need now is a very clear path. How are we going to get from A to B? Another brother said, the first thing is, let's open up the discussions about those select key ideas. Mm -hmm. Salahuddin al he did this. Mm -hmm. Destroying the ideas about nationalism. Why would a Kurdish man like Salahuddin al be worried about Palestine? Mm -hmm. So just that today, why isn't the Pakistani leadership doing something about Palestine? Because Salahuddin, he did this. Mm. He, was, he was a son of Islam. Mm. He they, believed in this idea about ikhwa, about brotherhood. They mm. can't sort out their own problems. They're not going to liberate. I mean, for goodness sake, in my own city last week, 17 people died. They're dying. Uh, you know, the bodies are falling. It's unbelievable. Okay. Um, you know, in Pakistan, so whilst, whilst the leadership is, is inept, the people that we can see, they are demonstrating. So why would an Indonesian demonstrate? Yeah. Whose colour, whose yeah. complexion, yeah. whose you know physique, whose you know language, whose you know food is completely different for these people. So the bond is the bond of Islam, and this is what I think we really need to move forward with. What does that translate into? The bond of Islam is not just a right. spiritual bond; it's a political bond, yes, sure. which unifies yeah. people, which unifies their vision. Yes. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam established within the Sahaba, and this is why the generation after generation, Islam continuously succeeded. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing what you're saying but the frustration is that we are talking and we will continue to talk we need somebody to lead us it's not I can't see it happening in my lifetime if we're looking at the uh, the leadership coming from Turkey are we seeing Turkey leadership rising are we seeing Turkey rising once again is that what we're looking at Possibly, but currently at the moment, I think it is a bit of a, a dual game. Some of these rulers they play, mm. it very much is is a it's a photo shoot, which is important for them exactly. at the moment. Yeah. So yes, they had uh, issues with Israel. Prior to this, they had 25 years relationship. of relation of of a uh, 25 years of a uh, military relation with Israel. Yes. Trade. Um, trading with them, no problem with them. Mm. But I think since this uh, flotilla issue happened, there's been some sort of change there. Mm. Mm. Um, but at the moment, mm. if that if these people were to really were to move, all they need to do, all they need to do is the Turkish regime is send troops to surround the border of Israel. That's all they need to do. Mm -hmm. Egypt, all it needs to do is mobilize its troops on the border of Israel. All Jordan needs to do is exactly the same thing. If that is just the one action that they did, you'd find that the Israelis, in terms of what they are currently doing, there will be some sort of immediate stoppage to that. Yes, because they cannot stop because yes. they cannot stomach this. Yes. So as we are finding in Syria, where there's Bashar al-Assad murdering his population, we are finding armies, the army personnel defecting, because this is the future that they want to see. They don't want to see a regime which you know, puts their head fork down and sends out to everything that the US says and what Britain says and works for their interests. Their interests are the Islamic interests. And that's what we were talking in the break. These, these, these factions, they have rejected the new coalition, Syrian coalition, which is fairly much British-backed. And this is the British vision for Syria. Sure. So instead sure. they said, look, we don't want this. This is not the will of the Syrian people. We want an Islamic state. Exactly. Let's take this call. Uh, Brother Amir from Leeds. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Yes, do you have a comment or a question? 
Well, uh, just to, to Majid, really, he's absolutely spot on about his comment about Salahuddin. And actually, the last Islamic leader that we had that was like this was King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. If you look at your history, actually, he did unite people from different factions. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a, an enlightened pragmatist as a ruler. Um, so I just want to echo what you're saying, but I think, you know, you've got to recognize... King Faisal's achievements as well, please. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, apologies for keeping waiting. I think uh, uh, the brother mentioned King Faisal. I mean, if I remember correctly, <coughs> King Faisal made some very strong comments. And I wondered, what if he had been alive, if he had been alive, would he have allowed what is happening in Palestine? Would he have allowed, or would he have said, you know, we're cutting off the oil? That could have been an option. I think with, even with Gaddafi, you found that he was very vocal on certain issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for 95% of the stuff that he did, mm. including rejection of verses of the Qur'an. So whilst mm. I was in Hajj again, mm. the brother was speaking about Gaddafi and what had happened to him. Mm. He said, this person, he was so un-Islamic, he said, let's even take the word Qul of Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Because Qul is a reference to the Prophet. Mm. Oh Prophet, Qul mm. Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Mm. You know, say no did to the they, disbelievers. Did he really say that? He didn't say these things? Yeah, this is from a Libyan. <laughs> yeah, but how do we know? And, 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 and the rejection of the Sunnah itself. Yeah, so yeah, whilst right. on certain yeah. things, like for example, Gaddafi, he said we're going to make the currency into like a gold currency. Yes. There were some talks about this as well. And he was trying to work with some of the African nations on this mm -hmm. as a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Politically, you know, somebody might say that's a, a sensible thing to do. Uh, work in the favour or the interests of your region mm -hmm. rather than the interests of a foreign power. But at the same time, the other things, ideologically, in terms of what his convictions were, what he did and what path he believed in, was completely alien to his population. That's why he called he his... Suffered. That's why he called his own population menace and rats. Mm. Suffered. And he suffered. And I sometimes wonder that if our leadership was just to all, not to a section of the society, um, maybe he might be in a better, better position. But you both are so young, you know, and knowledgeable and passionate. And this gives me hope that maybe that, that day will come. Maybe not in my lifetime, but that day may come where we have that strong leadership. But I can't see that leadership coming from those places where we are seeking. Maybe it may be from outside, as you mentioned, you know, that we have created leadership, whether it was Marx or whether it was... Uh, yeah, so let's go back to this discussion of Karbala. Mm -hmm. You know, Imam Hussein, anhum, his concern at that time that there was a rule of Islam which is being violated yep. and therefore that needs to be challenged. So his approach <coughs> was to make sure that this rule is not abused mm -hmm. because that would mean in the future other people would abuse this rule and would abuse power. Mm. For us, in terms of lessons that we can draw from this as well, is number one, the, he saw a situation, he responded mm. and he worked, he brought, he mobilized certain people, he discussed and he went and, and he did an action to mm -hmm. serve and to change that particular situation. So for us, it's exactly the same thing as well. First of all, recognize what the situation is. So to our viewers, what I'd say strongly is to study the, study the history. Somebody says to us, right, let's go back to 1967 borders for Israel. Mm -hmm. This is what the Saudis have said in, uh, in the, in the yes, 2004, indeed. 2005, uh, 2003, I think, said this. Let's go back to the 1967 borders, we're fine. You can exist, mm -hmm. we will exist, and that's fine. Anybody who studies this, you know, says this is rubbish because in 1947, a foreign body of foreign, uh, foreign people came to a land, mm. removed the people, mm. occupied that territory since 47, mm. and told the other people that this is not your land anymore, on religious grounds, mm -hmm. and that was accepted. And ever since then, all other superpowers have accepted this as well, and have gone forward for this. So let's learn the history. In 47, what happened? In fact, the Zionists tried to do this in 1920, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they went to Turkey, they went to Sultan Abdul Hamid II, mm -hmm. who was the Khalifa of the Muslims, mm -hmm. And at the time it was a very weak Khilafah state because a lot of the territories had been occupied mm. by the British, by the French, by the Portuguese. Mm. Um, they said to him, look, we will pay off your debts. Mm. You have a lot of debts, we'll pay off your debts. Okay? We'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. We'll do that for you. All you have to do is give us this area, Palestine. And, and he was a son of Islam. He knew what the difficulty was. He said, number one, I will never ever do this. Because mm. this is a land which has been irrigated by Muslim blood. These were his words. It's been irrigated, irrigated. by Muslim blood in, in the defense of this land. We're never going to give this to you. Yes, if one day this system, this, this state is finished, you can take it for free, which is what happened. It was on the destruction of the Khilafah state that the 
creation of Israel that it could happen. Mm. So yes, there was a balance of power in the world where at least, even though it was weak, at least there was some sort of sense amongst the other powers that we can't do things at the moment because this power can challenge us, this, this power can act even though it's a weak power, even though it's called the sixth man of Europe. We need the Khilafat movement. The movement has begun from my under novice understanding. The conversation has begun. It began some years ago. I think there are certain people who are still very nervous about talking the Khilafat movement mm. because it, it's, you know, a few years ago, I remember I was, be, I was asked the question, the conversation has begun. I think what is needed now is a platform to have a serious conversation. And unless we have a serious conversation, we cannot move forward. But I think ultimately also, we shouldn't be indifferent towards people's concerns, even voicing that opinion. Sure. Because like one of the, one of the brothers who called in, he said when certain people come out and they air these particular views, or they show the true reality, for example, what's happening in Gaza, exposing mm. Israel, you know, they get branded as like extremists or terrorists and mm. etc. But I think this then comes down to the, to the <coughs> owner, the individuals as well, mm -hmm. is that naturally you're always going to go against the grain. All of the prophets, yeah, that, that have come, they all went against the grain. Mm. They were all ridiculed. They were all hated. They all suffered. But ultimately, what they didn't waver on mm. and what they, uh, what they refused to let go of was, was, was the deen of, Isla, uh, of, of, of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that we need to learn. And, and for example, uh, um, uh, when we look at the incident of uh, uh, Karbala, mm. when we saw you know, Hussein radiallahu anhu and how he stood up to oppression, yeah? He could have turned around and he could have done nothing. He could have been, you know, said, look, you know, they, they'll do this to me, they'll do that to me. But yet he stood firm and he persevered. And the same thing, you know, we can take that lesson from that instance alone and utilize that now in our lives and to hold firm to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what it ultimately comes mm -hmm. down to. Of course. And, and of course. you know, to be able to do this, to be able to actually, you know, go against the grain, you know, it sounds something strange, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. the Muslim is always strange because the Muslim does not... He, he does not conform to society. He does not change with society. But rather, it's society that is subject to the ideas of the Muslim, which comes from the Quran and Sunnah. So, even though it is strange, but that's good. You know, if someone came with something strange, it's going to return us something strange. Mm. We, we, you know, we well, all know yes, that. Well, yes, we've heard that so many times, isn't it? We've got to, we're into the last two, uh, two or three minutes. Um, Karbala has taught us a lesson, a lesson that we can never forget. But why do we need Muharram to remind us of our duty towards justice? It's because Muharram contains a story which is unique to Islam, absolutely unique to Islam. And unless we learn and talk and go back to our scriptures, I believe that the conversation becomes stagnated. Majid, I'm going to steal something from you, if you don't mind. I saw this on your, webs on your uh, uh, Facebook. Not that I have time to read Facebook, but... Um, and I'm going to read that to you because it brought tears to my eyes. It's to do with Gaza, and it said, Rockets may be above us, but they have forgotten that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above them. And if that doesn't make you scream with pain, nothing will. Pray for the people of Gaza, Palestine, and all those lands where people are being oppressed. But remember, we can do something individually and collectively. And there are lots of demonstrations happening all over the United Kingdom. I think there might be one here locally in Blackburn. Thank you for joining me, Majid. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, you always bring a different perspective every time we have you. Qasim, I know you have a sore throat, and, but I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for allowing us to intrude and come into your home uninvited. Jazakallah khair, look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. Assalamu alaikum. Did you know you can get free cavity wall insulation and loft insulation with Go Brit Green? In a non-insulated home, 25% of the heat you produce disappears straight through the roof. 
and another 35% through the walls, wasting you hundreds of pounds each year. Insulating your walls and loft will save you up to 400 pounds on your energy bills. To register for free loft and cavity wall insulation, call us now on 01254 278 354 or visit us online at www.gobritgreen.co.uk. Here at Joseph Fraser Solicitors, we have a dedicated team that will assist you in a wide range of legal services. We can offer our clients help with personal injury, accidents at work, industrial deafness, Islamic wills and family law. If you want a law firm that can provide you with a difference, then contact Joseph Fraser Solicitors today on 08456 537 529. आपके बच्चे आपका मुस्तकबिल पढ़ाई में उनके बेहतरीन ग्रेड्स यकीनन आपकी ख्वाहिश क्या आपका बच्चा कुछ सब्जेक्ट्स में कमजोर है और उसे ट्यूशन की जरूरत है ट्यूशन एक्सपर्ट्स गुज़िश्ता 10 साल से पढ़ाई में कमजोर बच्चों को ट्यूशन फ्राहम करके बेहतरीन ग्रेड्स हासिल करने में उनकी मदद करते हैं बेहतरीन माहौल पढ़ाई में मुकम्मल रहनुमाई फ्री असेसमेंट के लिए अभी कॉल कीजिए 020 3623443 या वेबसाइट विजिट कीजिए www.tuitionexperts.org Usmania Banqueting Hall Shadi Baya Salgira Parties or Digger Takrebat Kelly Behterin or Vasi Hall Abke Kushunko Dovala Karneka Zamin Usmania Banqueting Hall Tashrif Lai or Deke Hamabki Parties Ko Yadgar Banani Kelly Kese Koshahe Usmania Banqueting Hall 39 Wardle Street Manchester 0 triple seven nine two three nine zero eight two 27 नवंबर से एयर ब्लू लाया चार डायरेक्ट हफ्तेवार परवाजें मैनचेस्टर से इस्लामाबाद और लाहौर के लिए एयर ब्लू के नए और कुशादा एयर बस 350 पर पाइए मजीद परवाजें और मजीद सहूलियत زائد सामान पर डिस्काउंट वसी और आराम दे कैबिन बस सहूलत औकात एयर ब्लू फ्लाई रीडिफाइंड हे गाइस नॉन वन हियर जस्ट राइड एट द पाकिस्तान एयरपोर्ट एंड गेस व्हाट द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इज गॉन ऑफ ओह इट्स गेटिंग रियल हॉट रियल क्विक माय क्लोथ्स आर सोकिंग विद स्वेट I really want to get out of here, but the carousel belt's not working because there's no electricity. Has this happened to you? Yeah? Well, why didn't you guys tell me? Ugh. My dad just told me they're turning on the generator. Oh! 